Welcome to the New Books Network. Confounding, exhilarating, and contagious. Emotions matter, and so does applying emotional intelligence. Welcome to Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight, the podcast where emotions rule. Whatever the topic, how do hearts and minds collide? Find out with your host, a college professor turned globetrotting EQ entrepreneur. His mission? Each week, Dan joins prominent authors in decoding how emotions drive outcomes and make people tick. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for the 27th episode of my podcast, Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. The series appears here on the New Books Network, which has as its motto, sharing knowledge so people can thrive. Today's topic is making robots our friends, not our overlords. With me is Jamie Marisotis, the author of Human Work in the Age of Smart Machines. The publisher is Rosetta Books. Jamie is a globally recognized leader in philanthropy, education, and public policy. Since 2008, he has served as the president and CEO of Lumina Foundation, an independent private foundation committed to making opportunities for learning beyond high school available to all. Jamie previously served as co-founder and president of the nonpartisan D.C.-based Institute for Higher Education Policy. Jamie, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Dan. Absolutely. Looking forward to this. So why don't you help out our our listeners and first give them a a sense of what the book's about, a kind of an overview. Well, you mentioned in my bio that I've spent my career working at this intersection of learning and work. You know, my, my, uh, my professional career has been animated by this idea that we need to get more people into and through uh, higher education, workforce training, high quality learning, make it more inclusive, uh, generally make it better for individuals and society. But I think the people who work in education are increasingly being asked this question, this fundamental question, which is what is education for? And my answer in this book is simply that we have to prepare people for human work, which is the work that only humans can do. I think everyone understands that work is changing. It's changing because of technology, automation, artificial intelligence, and it's taking over more of the tasks that people used to do. I'm uh, not in the camp of those who are worried about the coming robot zombie apocalypse. Um, (laughs) That We should be much more focused on this idea that human work is not what's left over after the machines do their job. It's what we can do uniquely as as humans, uh, as compared to the smart machines. So, you know, they're Machines are clearly better at things like repetition and speed and and being able to reduce things to an algorithm, but but they can't understand things like subtlety and nuance. And more importantly, they don't really understand interaction with humans. So the more interaction that's required between humans, the less likely it can be done by machines. And that's the work that that humans can do, that's human work. So my argument in the book is, and I tell lots of stories about, about people in the book to sort of illustrate this, but that human work blends these human traits like compassion and empathy and ethics with our developed human capabilities, our, our collaboration, our, our critical analysis, our interpersonal communication. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think we're different than machines in a lot of ways, but, but I think the most important is probably for us as humans, work matters. I think we work not only because it helps us economically, we clearly need to make money, but also because it offers us social mobility, uh, uh, satisfaction, meaning, uh, and at the end of the day, dignity. I think that's what work is all about. Okay. In the prologue, you said the economy is rapidly becoming people-centered. I assume you mean we, we're certainly beyond a service economy, which is in some ways people-centered. Uh, you just mentioned human capabilities and enhancing those. What do you? How do you want to elaborate on that statement about people-centered economy? Well, you know, I think part of what what's happened with with work is, and particularly how our economy is growing, is that we know that the machines can do lots and lots of things. Uh, you know, again, they can be. Uh, perform things at rapid speed. They can uh, analyze these algorithms, et cetera. But our economy is increasingly becoming focused on humans because we need to make sure that the work that people are doing contributes to our economic well-being. Um, I'm not of the view that uh, 
humans will need to stop working and that we're all going to have to get universal basic income in order to meet our, our, our needs. I think that people are searching for meaning and dignity in, in their work. And that's what I think this people-centered economy is all about. There's interesting um, survey research from Gallup over the course of many years and they asked people uh, about this issue of what they get the most out of in terms of, of work. And what they say is that, um, that while they want to make more money, they say at higher rates that they actually want meaning and stability out of their work, not necessarily more money. And what's most interesting about that is that that applies even for the people in the bottom 20% of income. So I think this idea that people are looking for meaning is what this notion of a people-centered economy is all about, that we want to actually do things that matter not just to us as individuals, but to others in society. Okay. Of the presidential candidates, since we're in an election year, it seemed to me Andrew Yang, perhaps most of all, was talking about this new economy, being one of the younger candidates. Right. Um, I'm not sure how much you saw Yang on the debate stage, but do uh, you have any sense of what you think Yang particularly got right in his comments or anything you think he might have missed or gotten wrong by chance, or you just didn't have time in your busy life to notice what Yang was talking about? Yeah, I followed his his uh, campaign pretty closely. And I think he is right about the fact that we haven't paid enough attention to the ways in which technology is changing what we're doing. Um, I think that's very uh, smart and, and foresighted. And I also think he's right that we shouldn't sit back and wait for the machines to do things. Uh, we should be proactive. I'm not sure I agree with him about this idea of, of universal basic income. This is a, a concept that has been actually uh, talked about for many years, but I think has accelerated in the context of, of what we're seeing in, in recent years. Uh, to me, the, the notion that uh, Yang was talking about, which is that we should pay everyone this $1,000 payment um, in order to make up for the fact that technology is, is you know, um, going to supplant or replace what we're doing, I think, um, you know, belies the idea of what I was saying, which is that work matters to us because not only because of who we are individually, but because of who we want to impact through work. And so, you know, my view is that uh, while he raised the right issue, I'm not sure his solution was the right solution to the problem. Okay, yeah, because UBI would take away for that opportunity for meaning. It might give you stability, but it's it's missing the other half of the equation. Right. S- staying with politics for a moment, in the back chapter of the book, uh, you kind of broaden the lens, as it were, when you start to discuss society, politics, and democracy, and authoritarian instincts. Uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time on education, so maybe tee that up in a way by saying you, you noted, for one thing, that people with more education tend to be more democratic with a small d and less educated, more authoritarian. Why do you think that's the case, and, and what can we do to I, – I'm in favor of democracy. What can we do to rectify that situation? Everyone goes to school more, something else? Well, there's um, there's interesting um, long-term research, again, about authoritarianism and what draws people to authoritarianism or what I would call anti-democratic ten- tendencies. And it often comes down to fear, fear of change, fear of the other. And this tends to spike when people lose opportunity or never had it. So um, in terms of the long-term inequality or in terms of the short-term issues around what we've seen with COVID, I think uh, this um, attractiveness of authoritarianism um, is in one sense understandable, but it's clearly a threat to liberal democracy and, and is particularly a threat to uh, the ways of living and the diversity of expression and beliefs that I think democracy is designed to, to protect. And so you, know, you look at the COVID environment, for example, and um, you know we live in these information bubbles and these information bubbles tend to reinforce these anti-democratic tendencies. And so people are drawn to false information about things like COVID. And the punchline here is that you're more drawn to it if you have lower levels of education. And so you're more attracted by these ideas about authoritarianism um, and, and anti-democratic views with lower levels of education. So, you know, a third of Americans who haven't gone to college say that having a strong leader is good to, for the country compared to, you know, less than 10 percent of people who have college degree, a quarter say that military rule would be a good way to govern our country. And 
you know, so these are not good for our democracy, for our stability. So my view is that we need to do the things that contribute to the development of this human work ecosystem, cultivating critical thinking and, and ethical decision making and lots of those other democracy enhancing traits and, and capabilities in, in a lot more people. Uh, you know, I think we need to engage in this notion of active citizenship and, and free expression of ideas. And I think human work offers the meaning and the purpose and the chance for individual and shared prosperity that I think uh, a democratic system reinforces. Okay. You, you mentioned uh, in your book that Americans are segregated in so many ways, but one of them includes education level. Uh, if you can draw a map for us, are we talking blue states versus red states? I assume it's more complicated than that. Yeah, so there there are clearly uh, differences uh, by by geography, uh, uh, by um, income level, and most clearly by race. Um, you know, whites uh, have educational attainment levels that are almost twice the rate of African Americans and Hispanics in, in the United States. So the sort of racial equity element, I think, is is most pronounced. Uh, but you know, we do see geographic differences. So you tend to see higher educational levels on the coasts, um, less in the south, and sort of more of a mixed bag um, in, in the middle. But, you know, you've seen this play out again in the context of COVID and what's happened uh, in the environment uh, with, with COVID. And both these differences in education level and race have, have really played out. So we know about the, the higher death rates. Most people know about the higher death rates for um, African Americans in the context of, of COVID. Uh, but you know what what we've seen in in COVID is that African Americans are more likely to work in essential occupations and fields where job loss has been highest, fields like hospitality, retail, et cetera. And so you know most people who can work from home are people who have college degrees. Uh, the significant dis disadvantage that African Americans have in terms of college degree attainment means that African Americans are at considerably more risk because you know more than half of people with bachelor's degrees in this country are working from home right now compared to less than 10% of those with high school credentials. Those people who are working from home are obviously um, safer in, in the COVID environment. So there's, there's both sort of long-term issues around inequality, but also the near-term issues related to COVID that I think are important to underscore here as we think about building this new human work ecosystem. Okay, well, I'm going to stay with that theme of economic opportunity and uh, disparities of, of people's opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of great anecdotes people you've talked to, spent time with in the book. Uh, one of my favorites was Russell Lowry Hart at Amarillo College. Uh, can you tell listeners a bit about what he's managed to accomplish? And maybe you've got another second person in the book you'd most like to bring in here. Yeah, Russell Lowry Hart's the president of Amarillo College, um, a school that that really uh, struggled until they sort of put their thumb on the scale, if you will, of of uh, racial equity and decided that they needed to actually focus on improving both uh, the intake, but also the completion rates of the students that they are serving, uh, in their case, a, a largely a Latino student population. And they've made great strides uh, by making the learning, for lack of a better term, more personal. In other words, uh, treating people uh, you know, as individuals and meeting them where they are, making sure that they have the right opportunities that link them uh, to work uh, opportunities uh, or to further education opportunities if they want to transfer from Amarillo, which is a community college, to four-year institutions. And the net result is that the completion rate is significantly higher They've done a better job of, of getting people into jobs, and they've improved the rates of those that are going on to, to get a bachelor's degree. And so, you know, he's an interesting example of someone who is both a human worker. His, his job is to help people um, advance in, in terms of, of their own human work capacities. But he's obviously um, doing that for, for a large number of, of others. And, you know, there are lots of people in, in the book who I try to uh, profile as examples of these of these human workers to show that human work cuts across the economy. So, you know, I have a story about a professional wrestler. I've got a story about someone who runs yep. an, an entity that that um, that serves uh, people who've been victims of child abuse. But one of the most interesting, I think, is the person. His name is Joel Lewis, 
um, who works um, at Cummins Engine Company in Indiana, which uh, makes um, diesel engines. And he, he began working as a sort of classic assembly line worker, putting in a 10 hour shifts, putting pistons into diesel engines for Dodge Ram pickup trucks. And, you know, a couple of decades later, he's seeing the assembly process totally transformed. Uh, Joel's uh, uh, co-workers are actually robots. They call them cobots at, at Cummins, collaborative robots. And um, these are smart machines. They use advances in sensor technology and AI to share the same space, literally working side by side with the people. And so Joel is working not um, in, in a contrast with the machines, but in complement with the machines. And I think it's an interesting metaphor for the ways in which human work really is transforming. The machines are his partners. Joel actually spends part of his time training others, including not only his human coworkers, but his cobot coworkers. So it's an uh, interesting story. Yeah, no, I, I love Cummins. I've spent some time in Columbus, Indiana. You know, the the city is rich in architecture. It's a very progressive, uh, interesting, innovative company. Uh, so, no, that, that's fascinating. Just to go back to Russell for a moment, if I remember right, one of his innovations was realizing the students didn't have a lot of money. So they also created a like a, a wardrobe for people going out for job interviews. Exactly. You could, you could take something and put it back. I thought that was just fabulous. Yep. They've supported them in terms of, of, of you know, this idea of meeting the students where they are. Don't treat them like cogs in a machine, but understand what their life circumstances are. Um, help them deal with child care and transportation, help them deal with what they're going to do in terms of job interviews, et cetera. All of those things are smart, proactive steps that I think um, uh, more and more colleges and universities need to need to do. Yeah. Let, so let's let's go deeper into the colleges. I, mean, I come from a college town. I have a Ph.D. I've taught in college. Um, one of the things you're bringing up is kind of the the tension for some professors. They look dismissively as something that might seem a little too vocational or training in their mind. You have this quote, uh, you train a dog, not a person. How are we going to, in this new economy, uh, not take away the strong things in academia, the intellectual prowess that it can offer, but at the same time, indeed, make it perhaps more personal and more practical? How can that be uh, accomplished? You know, at, at the end of the day, um, I think that um, no matter what you are going to school for, and, and I'll use school here loosely, it might mean sure. a college or university, or it might mean some other type of workforce training uh, program, et cetera. You should always be getting two things out of it. One is specific content knowledge. So you should know something about chemistry or graphic design or history or whatever you're studying. And you should be developing these generalizable skills. These generalizable skills really are sort of related to what I call the human work traits and capabilities. And so it doesn't matter whether it's a short-term credential, a certificate, something like that, or uh, the PhD that, that you got. Um, all of those credentials should represent both of those things. I think from the college and university perspective, one of the things that uh, we've seen historically, and until fairly recently, a pretty deeply held view. Um, I used to hear people say this all the time, faculty members or college presidents, we don't, we don't educate people for jobs, we educate them for life. And, you know, the irony is that uh, we now understand that it's literally the same thing, because the same thing yep. that you be successful in work are the things that help you be successful in life. Being a good communicator, being empathetic, uh, being a strong collaborator, having deep ethics, all of those things are really important to make you successful, not just in terms of, of who you are, but what you do when it comes to your job. And, and employers, employers acknowledge this. They recognize this. They often say that the biggest challenge for them is these generalizable skills of people who are coming out of college and universities. They want to see more of that. They want to see a sort of deeper sense of those, those human traits um, and developed human traits and capabilities because they can teach them more about, you know, the specific accounting skills that they need or the specific design skills that they might need. But what what they can't do as well as an employer is help them be critical thinkers and strong writers and 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 people who sort of make good decisions or can work well in teams. Well, I, I'm sensitive to the topics. I remember going back to graduate school after teaching college for two years and all of the TAs took a course and it was entirely uh, literary theory. There was nothing practical in the course regarding how we were going to, you know, run the classroom, our interactive skills, all, all manner of things that 
matter to us. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, we're all going out there and the students are paying tuition and tuition's not minor. And, um, you know, are we equipped to, to really do the best job for them? So, yeah, anyway. and I think the, the pressures that, that you're talking about um, are, are real. And, you know, college and universities, um, uh, you know, do not get the soft treatment in, in my book. I think that they have a lot to do to change. Um, in an industry where the, the, the price that's being charged, the tuition, has increased faster than the rate of, of inflation for now four consecutive decades, I think there's a high level of responsibility for the college and universities to help answer that question uh, that I pose in, in the book, which is education for what? Um, and with the increasing price and the increasing concerns about affordability and the questions about the, the relevance of, of the credentials, they need to answer that. My argument is that we must develop our human traits and capabilities. This is not an option. This is a requirement. But the college and universities have a, a responsibility here to do more and better than what they've done in the past. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. One of the things, you know, this book is talking about lifelong learning, and I've I've had some wonderful professors who <clears throat> were so into their topics and absolutely in learning mode still. And at the same time, as is true of everything, including corporate America, there were people who were, you know, coasting a bit, and I'm not sure how much more they were learning, even though they were in a learning environment. And some of the best courses I took were team taught. It was as if a, having another professor there put them on their A game because they, they didn't want to be embarrassed in front of another student. Right. I, uh, or another professor. The, other. the, the uh, term lifelong learning uh, for people like you and I who, who've been in the system, um, it sounds like a great idea. From, from the learner perspective, the worker perspective, it sounds terrible, right? It sounds like a Yes, sentence. it can. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I, I try to talk in the book about this idea of wide learning that, that we should be thinking. You know, if machines do deep learning, they dig deeper and deeper into algorithms and, and they analyze data sets, et cetera. Humans are wide learners, right? It's wide in time, it's wide in people, and it's wide in content. And this notion that you're talking about uh, here about lifelong learning you know, what it really means is that it's a sort of ratcheting process where you're working and you're learning and you're doing other things to serve other people. Part of that meaning I was talking about in almost this virtuous cycle that has to be repeated many times over the course of a worker's uh, life cycle, not simply once. And so breaking this, um, this um, understanding of learning and work where people think, well, first I learn, then I work is a really important part of developing this human work ecosystem. We need people to understand that it is an ongoing process, but it is a virtuous cycle that I think helps you and helps society. You know, I, I like those terms and, that, and what it brings with it in terms of a different view on it. And I love wide learning. Mm -hmm. So going to wide learning from one of the things I thought was intriguing was the interdisciplinary nature of something you brought up. The medical students at the University of Virginia, if I read correctly, actually spend some time in the university's art museum to hone their skills of observation. Uh, I don't know if you have more to say about that, but maybe you also have some other instances where it's really interdisciplinary in a way we would not expect, but is enriching for uh, people's you know, knowledge and communication skills. Yeah, you know, it's really important to immerse yourself in this broader context. Uh, you know, that, that example is one. Um, you know, there are lots of examples of where in, in um, um, engineering schools now, you will see people uh, being required to take art uh, courses, um, art history courses, um, having to do more in terms of, of the development of their communication and writing capacity. Um, it is the development of these human traits and capabilities that's really, really important. Um, again, you got to know something about medicine to be a good doctor. You got to know something about sure. engineering to be a good engineer. But you increasingly are going to have to know how to interact with other human beings. Um, you're going to have to be able to understand how to um, analyze and assess human interaction um, in order to be empathetic, in order to be a good collaborator. Um, those things need to be embedded in the curriculum. Sure. Well, I've read that uh, doctors with good bedside manner uh, do tend to get sued less often for for malpractice. So, um, and there's evidence that their that their patients actually have a uh, you know uh, lower mortality rates, higher higher uh, um, uh, you know overall success rates. Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's uh, not hard and fast. You know, compassion, empathy, uh, projecting hope. Um, 
you know, really understanding where the person comes from, all those things matter. Uh, to go to a different example that also intrigued me, you mentioned the British mega firm Thomas Cook in the travel business failed, uh, did not meet the test of this new uh, economy because it's not as experiential and doesn't allow for much as much of a self-defined experience as people are looking for. Uh, you know, it's often mentioned that travel can can broaden your horizon, make you more interesting. Where do you think the travel industry might go as a as a learning tool? Is it possible people could have uh, experiential, transformative experiences as part of their travel, and that might enrich their their career for that matter? Yeah, I think so. I think there's an interesting question. We all, we obviously know that the travel industry, hospitality in general, has been decimated and is likely to yep. be uh, further impacted in, in in this environment. But there's an interesting question about how much do we need to travel and what should the travel be for? And, yep. you know, I, I will not be surprised if you think, you know, I run a, a national foundation. We have a substantial travel budget. Nobody's traveled since March. And it turns out we're doing our jobs pretty darn well in this environment. So the question is, how much do you need to travel for work in order to be successful? I would argue sometimes um, it's, it's important, but the bigger question is, should we be traveling more to develop our human traits and capabilities? And, and here, I think you make a good point, Dan, which is that I think part of travel needs to be immersion in culture, a deeper understanding of, of geography and place, um, interacting with people who are different than you. All of these things are richly rewarding I was able, I was incredibly fortunate in 2019 to take six months off for my job. I did a quote unquote sabbatical. I, I worked on this book that we're talking about right now as part of that. And, and I lived in London with my family. Being able to do that fundamentally changed my worldview. I think I am a better worker, a, a, a better um, member of my family because I was able to do that because I had such a deep, rich immersion in something totally different than what I'm accustomed to. Okay. No, I, I, I believe that can happen. Absolutely. You also mentioned the book that you believe this new economy is, means a shift in power from employers to workers. That seems, you know, a, of interest to us where a lot of people feel vulnerable right now in a down economy. But if that's the, the future, let's uh, offer some hope here for listeners and talk about that. W what will that power shift look like? So part of this is the, you know, we saw this occurring before COVID, which was, you know, we saw that employees or workers, we'll call them, because some people are working, but they're not necessarily in a job, yep. want more and more flexibility. They want more, more capacity to be able to set their own agenda. And so we saw that with the gig economy. We, we've seen that actually before the gig economy, when people were doing more and more of what they called independent contracting. Well, now we can see um, as a result of, of COVID that, in fact, there are lots of ways in which you can work in a more hybrid context um, and be successful. And I think on the back end of whatever happens, you know, I, uh, I don't know what post-COVID looks like. I don't know that the world will ever truly be past COVID. But I think what we're learning in this environment is that being able to use technology to accomplish certain things is a good thing. I'm not against technology. I'm pro-technology but I'm pro using the technology in ways that are appropriate for the, the speed and the convenience and the reliability and all those things. And then using our time as humans to interact with each other in ways that are more meaningful could make us more successful. So for workers, I do think there is a day coming where they're going to have greater agency, more capacity to be able to um, set their own agenda, to be able to say, here's how I'm working, here's how I need to work, um, and I think the employers, I'm, I'm an employer, are going to need to be responsive to that. Um, we, need, we need productive workers. We need people to be successful at what they do. But I think the gig economy and now COVID has shown us that people can be successful in lots of ways that don't require them to show up at a workplace, punch a clock, or put in their 40 hours or whatever it may be, that a more flexible work environment can lead to high levels of productivity and success. And and, and I think that's coming. Okay. Uh, one last question. So obviously you're someone who's continuously learning. Uh, you write a book, you, you publish it, uh, but you're still learning. So so what have you picked up since you finished the book? Where do you see your foundation going? Is there another book out ahead? What, what's next for you? 
you know, it's hard not to look at at the current year and think more deeply about issues about racial justice and, and equity. And so, you know, I think there is a, a big issue here at play right now around understanding what's happened in 2020, this sort of uh, r- reckoning, this awakening around racial justice and how that will impact uh, both the learning enterprise and the human work going forward. And so I've, I've learned a lot about that in this year that I think we're going to have to go deeper on and reflect uh, more deeply on going forward. Um, at Lumina Foundation, we're certainly um, on a long-term journey to be able to make uh, racial equity uh, a reality in terms of, of the learning system. But I'm confident that we're going to do that in the workforce as well. Perfect. Yeah, no, diversity is a step. Inclusion is a next much bigger step. Uh, and racial equity, justice, uh take a while. Uh, I want to thank you so much, Jamie, for your time. Uh, This has been Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight, episode number 27, Making Robots Our Friends, Not Our Overlords. With me is Jamie Meritosis, the author of Human Work in the Age of Smart Machines, and probably my first author whose book didn't have a subtitle, which is kind of a nice, pleasant relief. Uh, To check out other episodes of this podcast, please visit my company's website at www.sensorylogic.com. If you have a follow-up question for Jamie, you can email me at dhill at sensorylogic.com. If you've liked the episode, by all means, give it a rating or review on iTunes. Finally, I'd like to conclude every episode with an appropriate epigram. As we've been talking about learning and work today, I'll end with this quote from Mark Twain that I suspect you, Jamie, have heard more than once. Anyone who stops learning is old, whether 20 or 80, Twain says. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. Until next time, be kind and stay safe. Mm